Welcome back to the Fearless Future Podcast. We're your hosts, Glenn Schwarm. And Amber Schwarm. We are Gen Xers, and we are here talking about real estate investing today. But we have a lot of other cool stuff to talk about as well. But this is going to be the second part in a four-part series on locating off-market deals. And we've got four of the Ds we're going to dive into. But before we dive into that today, we want to have our Gen X moment. Since we're Gen Xers and we attract Gen Xers, a lot of our students and people that follow us are Gen Xers. I thought I'd play a movie clip for you right now, just a few seconds, and see if you can name that movie. And this is true for everybody listening. So check this out and see if you recognize this. Any monkey business is ill-advised. Any questions? Yeah, I got a question. Does Barry Manilow know that you raid his wardrobe? Give you the answer to that question, Mr. Bender, next Saturday. Go ahead. What's the name of the movie? That is from The Breakfast Club. How about that? Is that yes, great? That's a, such a good movie. Oh, my gosh. That is the best. Yeah, I remember when I was a kid. Did you watch it when you were a kid? I don't know. I don't know if I saw it when I was a kid because I wonder what year that came out. Well, I, it was probably in 84. So it's been. So probably not. 40, 40, been wow, like 40 10 years then. ago. So that when that came out, I was no, I was about 16, 85. By the time. Remember, back then when movies came out. It didn't hit like it does now. Like now a movie comes out, it hits Netflix, it's out. Everybody right. watch it that night or whatever, you know, streaming station it hits where then it had to hit the VHS series. It had to go to a video store and you had to get the videotape because other people had the video. Sometimes it was sold out. Yeah. And I remember watching that at a girl named Jenny Hanley's house in a town called Round Lake, New York. And uh, I don't know if she'll ever hear this on here, but it's why am a, I not surprised that you watched it at a girl? No, house? no, no. She, she used to have parties at her house. She always had parties. It wasn't that kind of girl, but we had, we had, um, shut up. We had, <laughs> we had, uh, yeah, I love the eighties. I miss my high school days. Anyways. So we used to have parties. She used to have parties all the time at her house. It was like an hour drive for my parents to take me there, but we would go to her house and have parties. And she played the breakfast club. We'd sit and watch that. And we were all about 16. So we okay. were right around the age when this happened. So it just, it like hit home. Yeah, I was only 10 or 11. So I doubt I saw it when it came out. I probably saw it later as a teenager. Do you remember that about a decade ago, I took you yes. to Proctor's Theater? Molly Ringwald was there. We watched the movie. And she talked about we it. We watched it with Molly Ringwald, yes. right? There was about probably a couple hundred people there, or a few hundred people there. And we watched it. She talked all about the filming yeah, and they asked her questions. Cool. She was probably, well, she's, I think she's, I think she's my age. I think she's 55 or 56. She was probably about 45 back then. Yeah. But she talked about the fun. movie and making the movie and all that and all that. Oh, that was fantastic. Yeah. So let me ask you, who do you think you're most like in that movie? There's four four characters in the movie. Well, I was never the little rich girl, so I was never R Molly Ringwald. No. Um, I was probably most like the brunette girl. A little... Oh. The little one quiet. Who would, the one who would tie the string around her finger yeah. until the blood sticking out. And then also. She, I mean, I'm not going to say I was identical to her, but. She but was the like, one that was. Eat, I, I was kind of quiet and I would. Kleptomaniac. Observe. Kleptomaniac. I wasn't like that. I wasn't a thief. But but like as far as her demeanor goes with with being a little bit shy and a little bit quiet and, yeah. and observant, I, that was probably that described me the best. Like I would really observe my surroundings before I would get involved. And, yeah. So uh, she was the one that was, you know kind of homely as the movie started and then she became beautiful at the end when um uh, what's his name andrew was the yeah. actor the, the, not the actor's name i can't think what his name is right now but um, uh, emily was yes thank you yeah. yeah charlie sheen's uh brother half brother or whatever they are so yeah i uh yeah very very cool so yeah ali ali sheedy right ali sheedy yeah. yeah so who am i oh you're the jock i don't know i i would think that i was a combination of the jock and bender I had older uh, brothers. Okay, I had older, I had older I, brothers in the seventies, sarcastic, you know, wise ass. Um, you know, always have a comeback. Always, <laughs> that was never a problem for me. That's true. Yeah, always in a uh, rebel. I, I was a rebel slash jock. But you were never the um, like as far as your look goes. You were never that. Um, well, I couldn't. I went. To Christ, I went to Christian school. Yeah, and they were very strict on our hair length and all that kind of what we could wear and all that stuff. Yeah. So that was no. I no. I was not that, but. Yeah, I'd say I'm probably a combination of those. They call that emo now. What's emo? Emo, like his character, like the, in in the day, they, we would have called those people freaks in, when I was in school. What people? Like, um, like Bender. His, oh, his we call them burners. Burners. Burners, stoners. freaks, stoners, yeah. Stoners. So now those kind of people, the, the new term is emo. I don't get it. Emo, that's, that's what. Like the, emotional, like emo. That's, that's, that's what they're called now. They're emotional? 
they have emotional problems. This generation is so weak. They're called emo. They're emotional yeah. problems. They got high. They had fun. <laughs> they were sarcastic. Come on. Yeah, we, we live yeah, in a very- he came from an abusive family. He, well, he did. That's true. Yeah. That, that is true by him. So anyway- so listen, so there's our, there's our, well, what's, uh, what else is new and happening? We should talk about what happened this oh, past yesterday weekend. Yesterday we sent off our, our dear, dear friends, Becky and Pat, they came to visit. And I got to say, it's so nice. You know, we lived, I live, you, you're from New York, but I lived there for 15 years, 15 long ass winters, um, which felt like all year long. That's why I said. At least you've never winters. mentioned it and thrown it in my face for 15 um, years. That, that's been a pleasure. But, for but me. I got to say in, in the, we've been here for three years this summer here in Florida. And the first year we were here, we had more company come to visit us That's than true. the 15 years combined we live in New York. when we lived in New York. Yeah. So I just, I think it's kind of amazing. And I love that we live somewhere where people want to come and visit. And when they come here, we can do fun things and go out. Like, I think that I was so exhausted from them being here because they came in on Friday afternoon. And the first thing I did was take their older boys who are what, 18 and 16? 16 and 18. Yeah. Took them out on jet ski rides. We saw mm -hmm. dolphins while we were out there. We saw mantis. We saw rays. But I took them out. And of course, it's not an easy jet ski ride. I went out hard because oh, no. they're, they're young boys and yeah. we tough them up, right? So we we did all that. And then we came back in. Then we went to the ball game, went to a Rays, New York Mets game. Yeah. And we watched the, the Rays won that the Rays game. Won. They did. It was very exciting for us. And we had great seats. Almost caught a ball. Really close to us at one point, about only about a foot over our heads. We and just... you guys went there, and Becky and I went and walked on the beach and ate at a restaurant on the beach oh, and watched nice. the sunset. Nice. Got hit on by a couple guys. Ne oh, nice. How'd that go? We should hear <laughs> not I've, well for them. I've not heard about this. <laughs> I'll have to hear. So tell me about the guy that hit on you. I'll have to hear about that. I, I haven't heard <laughs> I this. I did tell you. The guy came up, and he's like, well, I'm a couple drinks in, but you look really familiar. Are you uh -oh. are, like on TV. Do you know what's funny? I didn't know that you... I didn't know that you were telling me the guy hit on you. I thought you just told me some guy saw you on TV. Well, maybe he did. I don't know. Maybe okay. it wasn't hit on. I was never good at determining that. Was he good looking? I didn't look at him that way, honey. Well, tell me, was he? <laughs> <laughs> Why, do you want to go date him? I said, no, I just wondered <laughs> if you're going to. So, <laughs> how interesting. So, anyways, then we then on Saturday morning, we got up and uh, went to the beach. We, we, yeah. walk, we literally get to walk about four minutes when you're when you're pulling a pulling a wagon full of gear for the beach, it's about a five to six minute walk. Yeah. But we're literally our feet are from our driveway to the sand in about four or five minutes. Right. And so to the Gulf of Mexico, we have our own beach in the back as a dock, and then we have the on the Gulf of Mexico. And so we we all I walked over there and got us set up with the tents and everything. We hung out there for several hours till Chassis basketball game, which oh we should talk about that oh, really quick. Oh, that was awesome! Oh, what a great game that was. Let me let me let's let's finish the weekend. Then, then let's do the let's talk about the story with the the game. So then, so and you guys will want to hear this because it's it's a true. Yes. you'll want to hear this. Just yes, trust it's us. a David and Goliath story yeah. that's going to really inspire you. So the next thing we did was. That we went to the ball game, which was fantastic. Yeah. We went right from there down to downtown St. Pete, which we is beautiful. Walked the pier. Do you know I had over twenty thousand steps that day on my on my Apple Watch? Yeah. Over oh, twenty thousand steps. I know, yeah. just a lot of lot of walking. Yeah. So we were we were wearing them out, right? Yep. Went down to the pier. Went did, did all that. Had we dinner showed around, down had there. Dinner. Went and had gelato. Did all that. Yeah. Came back next morning. We get up on Sunday morning and got a boat. Went and got a. Yep. We're part of a boat club, so we went and got a boat. Went out, took an hour and a some odd drive up to a place called Hollywood Island. Hollywood. Uh, Cal there's Caladesi and Honeymoon Island. Yeah. yeah. So we got out there. Beautiful we, water, clear, crystal clear. We had to park Tide the boat. was low. So we got to like walk on the sandbar. The, and by the way, at, at night we were fishing. Every mm -hmm. night we were fishing right in our back, right off our back dock. We were fishing right there. So we did all that. Cruz caught a crab and played with it for a while. We did. So we had a great boat ride there, great rope. And I, I made the mistake of coming down the intercoastal or, yeah. or going down the Gulf. Then we got the crap beat out of us. And the, it was very <laughs> choppy. Oh my God, it was terrible. So bang, anyway, bang, bang. yeah, that was, that was interesting. So we did that. And then by the time we got back and we were fishing that night and the next morning they were going to leave, they're like, we're exhausted. We're exhausted. They, they had to go to Universal to slow down, right? To, to, <laughs> to relax. To relax. So that's where they went for the- they But I loved seeing them. They're just- oh. So Our to, dearest friends. Talk about Gen Xers. We met in sixth grade. Mm -hmm. So Becky and I have been best friends since sixth grade. We actually were each other's prom dates back in her junior year. I was her prom date for her for her her school, uh, Colony High School. As and friends. It, oh yeah, as yeah. friends. Yeah, we've always just been friends. And uh, she's like she she has Becky has two sisters, so there's no boys in the family. I have three brothers, no girls in my family. So she was like my sister, and I've been like her brother yeah. to all of her sisters. 
and always been very close to that family. Just love them. They 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 They're feel they feel like family to us, and yep. it's been been amazing. So we love them. So anyway, basketball game. Yes. So our daughter's on a basketball game, and I coach the basketball game. I'm 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 an assistant coach on the team. So so the ages of the girls here are between eleven and fourteen. So our daughter is on the younger side of that. She's eleven, yes. and she is by far the smallest one on the team. But boy, does that kid have piss and vinegar. She is tiny but mighty. Yes. Yeah, she's a she's a, she's a fly to them defensively. Yes. She will not leave them alone. She's an annoying mosquito in your ear at night. She yes. just won't leave them alone. So only four girls showed up to play on our team. You've got to have five players in the team. And so four showed up. Now, this is a this is a Christian league, right? It's, it's a Christian league. So it's it's uh, it's really, you know, they start with prayer and they all the kind of stuff. And they it's it's supposed to be sportsmen and all that. But there still are rules it's that we abide by. Though. It's very competitive. And so we get to the game and the guy that is my main coach, he's a great guy. And he he is the guy that runs this entire organization of 300, oh, yeah. 300 different kids. So he runs the whole thing. And he's the head coach for our team. He's the head coach for our team. His daughter plays in our team. And lo and behold, about one quarter in, the other team put four players against our four players to be fair. That right. seemed like a fair match. Well, they started to lose. They were down by two baskets and they put a fifth player in. So now they put in five to four because they were losing. Right. And this is a team that normally they're a very good team. And they were losing to our four players. Now our four players have no room for timeouts. There's no breaks for them. Yep. There's no substitutions. No subs. If somebody fouls out, we're down to three players. Right. And so this is getting a little hairy and I'm mad. I'm like, I can't believe this idiot would put, I didn't care for that guy anyway. He's just always a little bit arrogant to me, this other coach. but. He, I couldn't believe that he put five another player in yeah. five on four to try and crush our girls. Right. And lo and behold, the game continues on. And my head coach looks at me and says, Glenn, we're not victims. He said, we are not going to teach these girls how to be victims. This is, that's his right. I don't necessarily agree with it. I wouldn't do it, but this is right. It's his legal right to do it. He can play five players. If that's what he wants to do. That's what he does. Otherwise we had to forfeit. No. If you don't have five players. No, not at all. No, you can play, you can play as few, you play one if you want to. All that's right. up to the coach. So. The, yeah, there's no, the, don't try and do basketball rules. So not you, my, not my area of expertise. So anyways, the long story short is that our kids won. Yeah. Our girls won. They were almost fouled out. They had no more fouls. They were exhausted. We kept taking timeouts so they could, they could uh, breathe, breathe and take a, and water. Get a break. Yeah. And that other team tried everything they could to crush us. And they did not crush us. Yep. Statistically speaking, we were supposed to lose. Right. We were supposed to lose. And we didn't lose because they had such heart and such grit. And they fought and that other team thought they could win easily with five, with five players against four. Yeah. But the grit and determination of our team, including our daughter, they pulled it out and we won by three points yeah. at the end of that game. And it was unbelievable and incredible. And what an inspiration to be at that game. But that made victory taste even sweeter that we defied the odds, you know, fought against a good team with an extra player than we had. Yeah. And I just I think that was such a good example to our girls too to not give up no matter what even if the odds aren't in your favor. This is a perfect segue into today's training. Yeah. Cuz I I mean the training portion of this we want to kind of educate people on. I don't want to just train I want to talk about it but you know, I think right now we're in a we're in a situation in the country where people say I can't find deals. Yeah. I can't find I, I want that all the time. I want real estate I can't find deals. There's no deals to be had out there. That's like that's like being a victim and saying, well, I can't win this game because it's four on five. Right. Nothing There's so much can, competition. Right. Yeah. So much. Think about that. That's four yeah. on five. They were playing. Right. So they were they were out. Man, what a perfect segue. This yeah. just sort of happened here organically, which is great. But there has been, you know. There's a lot of technology, a lot of advancement, but there's something that's never changed. Motivated sellers. Right. No matter what market, would you agree? No matter what market, and, they're always you, happening. You just have to know where to look. These are all things that, that happen during life. Now, in the last episode that we did, we listed off all of the motivated sellers uh, types, all the Ds that we talked about. Right. And in this podcast, this episode, I want to dive down on four of them. And these are in no certain order, but I want to dive down on four of them because these are the things, again, when someone's motivated, that's what makes them want to or have to sell a house now, usually for cheaper. They want their cash. They want to get out and they're willing to get out of that deal a lot less expensive. And they typically typically don't want to go through traditional channels like listing it with a real estate agent. Right. They don't want the headache and hassle of all that. And, and they just want someone to give them cash right. and walk away from it. So they're willing to take a, take a hit. 
So let's talk about dilapidated. That's one of the D's. Yeah. So, you know, a dilapidated house is is a house that might be falling apart for one reason or another. You know, maybe the roof is bad. Maybe there's um, a hoarder situation. Maybe the, the house just is in need of a lot of repair and, yeah. and people either don't want to or they can't afford to fix it. Sometimes I thought, find over the years we've bought homes that people have inherited and they didn't have the money to keep up, up keep the house. Right. I'm thinking about one we did in Rotterdam where the, the remember the house that had the, uh, the domesticated rats they were growing in the house. Oh, that was disgusting. And they and the and the giant buckets of piss that I so, saw upstairs. So let's tell that story. Well, let's. Why it was dilapidated was too the grandkids. The the son inherited the house, and right. they let his grandkids move into the house, right. rent free. Who were drug addicts? Who drug addicts? Yes, but yeah. continue on. So so we walk in the house. We're looking around with the agent. By the way, that's <clears> that's <throat> two doors down from our friends Becky and yes, Pat. Yes, it we is. We just talked about it. Yes, yeah, yes, yeah. So we walk into the house. We're like looking around. Uh, you go up, we go upstairs and you open the door and it's pitch black. Oh, and, oh, and, oh, man. and then you, you were like, you had this weird feeling that I'm not alone here. Yes. So you yes, said, I hello, hello. And then you hear like somebody groan. Yeah, the guy goes, mm, I, oh man, my heart stopped. Yeah. I know it's going to be attacked. They, they had, they had blacked out all the windows right. with paint. Like with, newspaper or foil or something. Yeah. Which drug addicts usually do. Yeah. Um. So you close the door and we, we left that room because we didn't know what we were walking into. And the, do you remember the smell of the house? I do. We that we house, had to take shifts. Yeah, it was so bad. Yes, I don't think masks would have helped. Like it was, I I almost gagged in that house. Yeah, There's only know. two houses we've ever been in that stunk that bad. The other one was in Saratoga, which smelled like a dead body. Oh yeah. But um, do you oh, remember that yeah, one? Yeah, I do. We didn't buy it. We didn't yes, buy that. House, I remember that one. Yeah, that, that one, was nasty. I, 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 that I smelled like someone had died. It you, did. It did. It yeah. was so bad. And then the guy pulled up as we were leaving, yes, and he was yeah. in like this pristine like a, BMW. Yeah, like it was remember, beautiful. Yeah. Anyway. I'm like you live in that. Well, oh, remember that. Anyway. So, so in that house, that, that house, uh, that was where it was, the, it was freezing cold up. So they didn't turn the heat on or whatever. So, but then heat rises. So that's why they were staying upstairs, so, but they didn't, they didn't want to go downstairs to go to the bathroom. So they were peeing in like milk jugs. But remember it was frozen. It was frozen. And I, and I, I got really close. So I go, what are these? And I looked, I go, and I remember picking up the one by the handle. It's a gallon milk jug. Yeah. I, I pick it up. I get, I start looking. I go, oh, this is piss. I put it down. I'm like, oh, this is foul. And then later on, the neighbors told us that they used to like pour it out of the window when it would fill up. Or they just piss out the window. But yeah. They said that too. I don't too. know why they didn't do that. But, but, well, I don't know. But, but it took us, uh, I think, three 30-yard dumpsters to clean yes. that house out because they also didn't want to pay for trash pickup. Right. So they were shoving all of their Chinese takeout and pizza boxes and all <laughs> that in that? the attic eaves. Remember that? The entire garage was filled with garbage. Yeah. They raised domesticated rats you're, and so you're everything about, smelled like piss You're in talking the house. about hundreds and hundreds of pizza boxes, not like hundreds. a dozen, like oh, yeah. hundreds of them. Yeah. Yes. It, the house, yes. it was so disgusting. Yes. And then they had domestic, they were, they were raising domesticated yeah. so rats. all the insulation smelled like piss. It was, <laughs> it was awful. There was, was like bad. rat crap everywhere. Oh, the that joys, the foul. joys, the joys. So, so for those of you guys who are listening, you're saying to yourself, oh my God, I would never do that. I want to tell you something. That deal we probably made 70 or $80,000 yep. on. So I always say that smell. That smells like money. That's the smell of money. Because yep. nobody else wants to do those right. things. And they're not all like that no. by a long shot. But we, when you've done a thousand, over a thousand deals like we've done, you've been in, you've seen some situations. That was one of the houses that, before we even went in to do our scope of work, though, we had it cleaned out because I couldn't even stand in the Correct. house that, yeah. that long because it smelled that bad. You remember, like, the, you remember the cat shit in the, in the, oh, in the yeah. floor downstairs? In the basement. It was crunchy. It was, yes. it was, there was not one square inch that but didn't have a cat on. turd. Right. There wasn't one square inch and it was all white and like rotten and cold. It, it was disgusting. Oh, was yeah, that was a, that was a disgusting <laughs> house. So that So that's, that's one, how, there's another one I'm thinking of too that was sort of recent. It was one that we did a show on our YouTube channel mm -hmm. um, and we, we had, there's video footage of it in our YouTube channel. Gosh, if we can, if we can find it, maybe we'll link it up here, but it's, it, it was during the uh, journey with the Swarms, okay. one of those episodes. And I was actually trudging through snow that was waist deep to get yeah. to the house. But remember the hoarder, there, there was four foot of trash, yeah. the entire house. Yes. Remember that? Oh, yeah. And then when we took you out. You had to climb over the pile that was separating like the living room from the kitchen. Yes. You climbed over that and there was like a disgusting fly trap thing hanging up. Like, yes. like that's really going to help in yeah. the house. And I'm like eyeball to eyeball all the flies. <laughs> and then, but then we, when, when we finally had it cleaned out, first we found like 30 rifles. Remember yeah. that? I, we, oh, I, I forgot about that. Yes. And I, you know, just a side tip here. When you find things like that in a house that you buy, those are yours. 
we actually took those to an auctioneer, made like three grand yeah. by three grand in cash for selling those rifles. And then I, we kept, I don't know, I kept another 15, 20 of them myself. Yeah. And I think I gave a couple to my son. And, you know, so we, we, we have, there's some cool stuff you find yeah. in those houses too. But remember that we pulled all the trash. We didn't, we didn't do it, but right. we had it. Employees did. Yeah. They pulled away all the trash and there was a three or four foot hole, hole in the, in the kitchen floor that led to the basement. That, that, the, that fully, the pile of garbage rotted out the floor. Yeah. yeah. Fully, fully old, the, like a giant hole. Like, yeah. I mean, you could literally fall down it. And then they couldn't figure out what was going. They finally found that. This is sad. But they the found dead the dead dog in the basement. They found the dead dog carcass. Yeah. It was like, it was jerky. Yeah. It, it was so old and so rotten. Didn't even smell anymore. That, like yeah, it was, no, yeah. it was, it was pretty it was bad. bad. So, so that, that was pretty, that was pretty that bad. house, like as you're walking up the stairs, I, I remember seeing like, it looked like blood finger marks on the wall. <laughs> oh, oh, that was the house that you said, let's just let's paint, just paint over it. it. Let's just paint and it. And I'm like, honey, you can't do that in this house. The paint isn't, you know, even if you put a good primer on it, it's not going to cover it. And, and Aaron from we, PPG. Yeah. Um, Aaron was like, yeah, Glenn, you need to listen to Amber on this because that sheetrock had to like I didn't go. want to it spend was, the money. You want to tear sheetrock out. I'm like, no, I don't want to tear sheetrock out. It was so disgusting yeah. and so like and smoke covered like it was yellow so you can imagine when you're looking at a house that those houses are motivated sellers because at some point they are they can't live in that situation anymore by the way here's how you know it's a hoarder house when the person says oh by the way i'm not a hoarder but follow this path over here because yeah. they have a path carved out to get around that's how they the, do the it bathrooms so. were worse than any yeah. 1980s oh, gas station bathroom was, i ever remember going in well when like, you were when you're adult diapers when that you're, were, yeah when you're defecating in the in the tub, tub. it's just that's yeah, nasty so yeah. but but again the, this is the extreme we're talking about right this is the extreme right. but a dilapidated house like that is a it produces a motivated seller because at some point somebody in inherits that house or they have to get out. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and we've talked before about stacking motivators, right? So they may have had health problems. I don't remember why they left, but a lot of times people that are hoarders wind up with a health problem right. or a mental health problem. So they have, they have um, disease, which is one of the D's on top of a dilapidated house, right? They may be, they may be falling behind in payments. So, and then if somebody inherits that house, they're disgusted, right? They're disgusted. They don't know what to do and they don't so want the to more, clean it out. So the more motivators that somebody has, the more of a motivator so that they are, but I, I think it's important to stay here too, especially on like the hoarder type of situations and the dilapidated. Um, those houses mm. don't cost hardly any more money than than the That's so than the true. beautiful, That's pre, so true. you know, mint condition 1980s house right. that people have that are super clean. Because even if the house is is disgusting like that, it might cost you two thousand dollars more to clean it out, or four or five, but it, but it will cost a little bit more. Right. But yeah. So it might cost a little bit more, but but remember, you're not doing the work. Right. You're hiring that out. Right. So somebody else is taking care of that. But even the house that's in the mint condition, but it's still dated, yep. it still costs, you know, you still have to put in a new kitchen and new bathrooms and new flooring and new paint and all, all yep. that stuff. So the, the nasty, disgusting hoarder trash filled houses right. don't cost you that much more to rehab we and, and you have less competition because not as many people want to tackle them or even walk in and look at right. It. Right. They walk in and go, oh, my God, they don't want it. Right. The, the hardy real estate investors like the hardy Gen Xers. Right. We don't have a problem looking at those houses and saying, wait, there's money to be made here. But it took us a while to realize that it's only a few thousand dollars difference right. between a hoarder house. And because sometimes when you walk into a pristine house that you're a, like, oh, this isn't that bad. Well, no, that a grandmother owned and it's in mint condition, but yeah. but it's still got a kitchen from 1974 in it. Right. But it's in mint condition or maybe 1985. You walk in there and go, gosh, this is really in good shape. It's no different, like you right. said, than a house you got to pay three to five grand or two to five grand to clean out. Right. Because the same amount of work has to happen except right. for the clean out. Right. But it took us a long time to realize that. Right. And one, one day I'm like. Thanks for repeating what I just said. Thought I'd be like Mark, that guy that used to do that at the <laughs> meeting all the time. So as I was saying, and I'm thinking Amber just said this. So I guess I'm being a little redundant. Just want to make sure they heard you. That's all. Because I think it was a very good it point. It was such a good point. You wanted very, to reiterate it. I really did. It was, Thanks, a good, it was a good point. So anyway, so how do you find those houses? Let's talk about how you find how you find dilapidated houses off market deals. Yeah, I mean, like one way is definitely driving for dollars, um, which is where you're just literally driving around neighborhoods. You're looking for houses that look dilapidated. Yep. Now, in that case, we wouldn't have seen that one because the outside, ironically, had already been redone. It had new siding. It had new windows. Yeah. New roof. It was just the inside was really scary. Which one? The first uh, the, one we talked the about? Hoarder the hoarder house. One. The hoard, so the hoarder house, you know what was different on that one, though? The backyard. Remember, it was full of trees. Yes. Completely grown up. It was grown yeah. up. Yeah. 
So, so, you know, you can look around driving around for dollars, you know, in, in the Northeast in the winter, one thing we do is look for uh, driveways that weren't plowed. Right. Um, in the summer, you look for grass that isn't mowed, or you might look for code enforcement notices on the doors or windows. Right. You know, you can tell if code a house for, needs work. It, hoarders don't necessarily have code violations, though. Some I mean, they do. Might, some they, do. Some don't. Might. Like if their grass is getting too high or something. They, they usually know because a neighbor complains. Yeah. The neighbor complains about the smell or the right. trees in the backyard, that kind of thing. That's a good place to find it. You know, I think, the, again, we've talked in other episodes about how important it is to network with people that are going to be in front of a, mo- of a seller like that. So a dilapidated house, there's a good chance that somebody might call a contractor. A lot of times they don't call contractors. They're so embarrassed right. about their house. They don't want to call. Or they can't afford it. Right. So or they, they can't afford it. it. Right. Yeah. So, but if it's something bad enough, like if it's a plumbing leak or something emergency happens, right. then, then they, they, have, have they have to deal with that. So talk to contractors and, and other kind of repair companies. That's kind of, uh, that's important. So that's dilapidated. We talked about uh, what they are, kind of gave some stories there and also how to find them. How about dated? Yeah. In large part, I mean, almost every house we've ever bought is dated. I mean, I think I can only think of a couple of houses that they were good as is. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so that's going to be pretty much every house, but you can target, you know, if you're doing any kind of marketing target houses that are 25 years or older and, you know, cause those kitchens and those colors and the, whatever they had put in there are probably going to be dated if they're that age or older. I think too, with, with data, I'm thinking about, you know, we've, again, we 95% of the deals we've done over the years have been, have, like you just said, have been dated, but I'm thinking about ones that are um, dated, but you want to keep them looking dated. Um, you want to, you want to keep the character of the house. There's a fine line there. That's, so yeah, there's a difference talk, there. Let's talk about that mansion that Troy. we did in Lansingburg, right? Troy yeah. Lansingburg. Cause that was a very interesting house. I'll, I'll, I'll say yeah. it, I'll describe the house and you tell it what it was. It was a 6,000 square foot, nine, nine bedroom, bedroom, two and a, two half, and a bath. half bath. Yeah. With like one closet. Right. Yeah. And it had like 15 foot ceilings downstairs or 10, 10 foot ceilings. It was high. It was built in 1890, Eight, I think. Yes. Yeah. I think 18, 1890. We found the original architectural. Victorian. Victorian. It had a turret. House. It, is that my saying it right? A turret. A turret. turret. A turret. Yeah. It had a turret all three levels. Yeah. It was Be- beautiful. Beautiful. And we took, that was a real gamble for us at the time. Yeah. And we took a swing at it because the bank had just put a new roof on it. Yep. And it was like that cost back then 25000 probably 50000 today. But they put a new roof on it. We're like, well, the matrix are done. Has to be updated. And the kitchen hadn't been updated since 1970. Some of those bathrooms, I think, were original from 1890. They were old. So talk yeah. about what you did with that because you did a great job with it. Yeah. With a house like that, especially, you know, being a true Victorian house, you don't want to, you know, go inside of it and and make it contemporary. Right. <laughs> you know, like right. like you need to stay true to the character of the house and yeah. like the woodwork in the house. You remember the oh, woodwork? Oh, it was stunning. And I, I'm not even a guy who appreciates woodwork. I was stunning. It what, was. What was the wood? It's no a chestnut. Chestnut, which, which, which I think is destroyed. It's, like, there's no like more you of can't, it. You can't replace it. Yeah. Right. It, it was it was stunning. The remember the the hardwood the floors, hardwood floors were the way they, all toothed yep. together. And the the um plaster, the trim plaster. Yes. Like it, it was amazing. Amazing. I think we ended up using over a hundred buckets of mud on that Correct. house. To redo the plaster and all to that. To redo the, all I the bad all spots that. and everything. Yeah. So so I had to stay true to the character. I didn't have to, but I think it was a yeah. smart choice to stay true to the character. So when we did redo the kitchens and we re- did redo the bathrooms, we still tried to stay true to the Victorian theme yeah. and, and make it fit the house instead of turning it into something completely different. Because yeah. that house and and one thing like like a lot of people, what they would do where they would they would turn that house into apartments. And we didn't want to do that. Correct. Like we, we actually had some pride in, in bringing that house back to its original glory. Yeah. So it was, it was, it was good, but yes, we did need to stay true to the character. We sold that house in the first day. Remember there was a hundred people at the open house because that yeah. guy was famous in the neighborhood. Apparently he, a lot of kids grew up in that house yes. and they were amazed. We spent a thousand dollars on a full page ad yeah. to, and it, and it, and it, I never saw it. We walked, you and I walked in the door, never saw never each saw other, other again, again for three hours. Cause it's three stories. It's huge. So Grand what, staircase. I mean, the, there were pictures of, oh, the owners came back to that not one. The, not the owners, but the, uh, well, the, the daughter, the great granddaughter. granddaughter. She had pictures of her grandparents being uh, married on the, the wedding, stair, on the stairs. On the stairs. Yes. yes. And so in her wedding dress. that was, that was crazy. But anyway, th- that was one of those deals where, you know, it, they were the, the bank owned it, but they were, it was dated. So people didn't want to touch it. Right. Because it was so dated in some spots. And big. Dated big. And nobody wanted, no one wanted to touch it because it was so big, but we took a swing at it. Yep. And we, and we made like, like 75 or 80 grand after we flipped that house and we sold to a guy who we spent a thousand bucks on an ad and the guy who buys it was out walking his dog and saw the, 
dollar fifty for sale yeah. sign that I had in the front yard. He goes, Oh, it's an open house today. And he walked in and said, I'm in love. I've got to have this, right? Yeah. And he bought the house. So I think it's important that when you're, you know, just understand that houses have all different levels of being dated. Right. And I think one of the ways you can find those too, driving for dollars is a great way to find dated houses because you can sort of tell on the outside, maybe if it's been, if it's not being kept up to not date. Not as easily, but correct. it depends on the house. Yeah. Right. Um, but you can also look at the age of the house. You can also go to towns and look up um, permits that have been pulled. True. So what kind of work has been done in the house over the years? So that's public information. You can look up and see what's been done. And that gives you some idea. Yeah. Uh, you can always look at as low as if there's any recent pictures if they tried to sell it before. You know, sometimes someone may have bought the house 10 years ago. And it, so if you look online, you see pictures from 10 years ago from Zillow. And then you realize that there's been no permits pulled. Again, you're doing some homework, but you can find that a house is dated. And that might be a way to, to get in the door right. and, and find that house. Or it's just always target by what year they were built to. Right. The next one is destination. Right. So destination, you know, somebody just might need to get out because they need to move quickly. They might need to move because they got a job in a different state or a different city. So they need to sell their house quick. Right. They might need to move because they have a family member that they need to, to go and take care of. So there's all sorts of reasons people need to get out of their house quickly. Um, and so those people might be in, they, they don't want to go through the traditional method because it take too, takes too long. So they just want to find a cash buyer so that they can get in and out quickly. Um, I'm thinking about that guy. Oh, I know who you're forget, thinking about. I forget where the house was. It was over, it was over outside of East Greenbush. Yeah. I remember it. Yeah. Um, and, and one of our agents had, had gone to talk to him and you and I decided that we wanted to go talk to him because he wanted to sell the house. He was willing to sell the house like really, really cheap. And there's some laws about taking advantage of people. Well, that law wasn't even in effect then. Do you know why we did that? There was a, there was a deal that we locked into with an unscrupulous uh, investor and he was going to sell a deal to us. My lawyer found out from the other lawyer that the guy was mentally impaired yes. and couldn't really make good decisions. And that other investor was taking advantage of him. Yes, bad. I do remember that. And my lawyer said, I'd get away from this deal yeah. if I were you. And so we did. It was shortly after that. That we came across this guy. That our, the girl who worked for us brought it to us that they want to sell this house for, I think it was like 75 grand. Yeah. He said 75. And I'm like, 75 grand. There's That's no, insane. There's nothing wrong with that house. Yeah. So finish. Yeah. So we want, I think we wanted to meet him for that reason we though. Wanted we wanted to make, to make sure. sure his head was screwed on straight. Yes. Like, you know, because we, we don't, we don't want to take advantage of We don't want to take anybody. advantage. No, of course not. Um, and, you know, let that be a notice to everybody too. Don't take advantage of every, anybody. Like, like make it win-win, you know, yes. make it, make it a good deal. Give, give our industry a good name. So we wanted to make sure the guy was, was mentally capable of making that decision. And he's, he was totally legit, legit. Yeah. Like he was like, no, I, I understand. I could probably get more for it if I put it on the market, but I'm just done. I just went through a divorce. I want to sell this and then he, move to Florida. Like, like I already like know where 60. I'm going. Yeah. He, he said, I'm 60 some years old. I'm going through a divorce. And I, I remember thinking, wow. Okay. He yeah. said, I just want to start over. He said, I have money elsewhere invested. I don't need it from this 75 grand. It's yours. And we shook his hand on the spot and said, done. done. And I, I don't remember the exact numbers. I know we've talked about it on another podcast, but I, I know that we, put it back on the market as it, I remember the house. I yeah. still remember walking around the house. Me too. Cause it was, I was thinking there's nothing wrong with this house. Like yeah, it was, it was in, in good shape. Yes. And he wanted 75 grand for it and we bought it, put it back on the market as is never touched it. Never even went back in the house again. And I think we sold it for like 175. Mm -hmm. It was crazy. We, we ended up netting like 80 or 90,000 after paying commissions and holding costs and everything. And it was and it, literally that was a deal that we found through direct mail to people going through divorce. Right. And that's how it stumbled onto him. So that's how you can find people with that is you can also talk to divorce lawyers. I actually, no, I take that back. We at the time were mailing to divorce lawyers okay. and letting them know of our service. That's what we were trying. Again, we're trying to network with people. So that was what the, that's what that was back then. We had letters saying, if you have any clients going through divorce, they want to sell their house. Boom. Um, and also, you know, things like bandit signs are always good. Those we buy houses signs because that catches people when they're driving the road, thinking about how much they hate their spouse and they just want to be done right. with it. So <laughs> they want to be out of the house. Right. So, all or, right. Or like moving companies or relocation services, you could get in touch with those people because they they might know of, of yeah. people that need to move quickly. They so, might. Yeah. Might be too late in the game. Might be. Yeah. But it's it's worth at least getting your name out yeah. there. These are all, again, these are all ways we're going over motivated sellers and kind of sharing that. And with you. to that note, though, whether we're talking about, you know, making relationships with agents or code enforcers or moving companies or dumpster companies, 
find something clever that you can give as a gift to that person that they put yes. on their desk. Yes. You know, a, a water bottle with your logo on it. Uh, a, 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 I don't know, stapler remover sure. with your name on it. Like, like find something that they have a to keep A giant picture under. of yourself. <laughs> a giant bust. <laughs> you <laughs> think no. that would work? Uh, you know, something that you can put on their, that they have to sit on their desk and see your face or your name all the time so that they remember, because it's out of sight, out of mind. So you have to kind of be in their face. fostering those relationships. Yes. So, all right, I'm going to take a little diversion here and I want to bitch for a second about lawyers for a minute because I don't know if you remember around this same time, we had a hot deal, maybe been a year later, we had a hot deal that came in something like this. And we took it to our lawyer, because in New York, you have to go through lawyers, right? You don't have to, but they make you do it. And so that seller, so we, we the seller got her lawyer involved. Do you know her lawyer bought the deal out from underneath us? I we negotiated it. It was like a seventy, eighty thousand dollars profit. It was going to be a fix, a fix and flip, but it didn't need very much work. I remember you being pissed. I was pissed. So the lawyer on the deal saw our contract for like, let's say it was $100,000 and he offered her $101,000. He upped our offer by $1,000. I called my good friend, my attorney, Chuck, and said, Chuck, I'm so pissed. This attorney just stole. There's got to be an ethics violation. And he said, Glenn, there's no ethics violation because a lawyer's job is to represent their client zealously and do the best for their client. Him giving her $101,000 is better than your $100,000. So technically, ethically, he did better for his clients. And only a freaking lawyer would think that stealing a contract is ethical. But that's how they have interpreted it. I I was so pissed at that. So when you're dealing with lawyers in a lawyer state, that can happen. So keep that in mind when you're going into the deal. And if that happens to you, You'll be good and pissed, but they can do nothing about it except for trying to offer more, but they listen to their lawyers. Yep. So it's crazy. All right. Last but not least. Last but not least is downsized. So, you know, this could happen because a couple of different reasons, you know, people get downsized from their jobs. Yep. So they can't afford their house anymore because they, they aren't making as much. Um, or there's also the affordability factor. You know, people need to downsize their house because it's just too expensive in general, or maybe they're empty nesters and don't just need, don't need that much room anymore. And they want a smaller home. So, but people in those situations, um, want, may want to get out of their house quickly if they, especially if it's an affordability issue, yep. they, they want to, if they're just empty nesters, those are probably a little bit fewer and, and further between because yep. those people might be fine going through a traditional method of it taking longer. I'm thinking about the house that we bought that was, uh, the woman who delivered me, her daughter, yeah. that was a monster house. They Huge had Miss Yuna yeah. and she had to downsize. She actually, she actually had two things going against her. She had destination and downsize. Mm-hmm. She had moved away. She's a doctor. She had moved away to, um, to another state. And then she was, she wanted to downsize too, because that house was way too big for her yeah. kids are out now. And she was stuck with that house. Right. So she had to move out of there. So those are, that makes people motivated to get out of there. That house we lost money on. That was not a good deal for us. No. We'll have to do a whole episode on that one. Yeah. So stay tuned because we'll do an episode on that one. That's a lot to dive into too much for this podcast episode, yeah. but there's a lot to talk about on that deal. And since we're very real people, we're happy to share that yeah. someday as some of our, our losses. Uh, what about the house that we helped David and Alicia, our students? What about that house that we helped them buy? Oh, yes. You know the details better on that than I do. I just remember some. So of which highlights. one? We've helped them buy, we've helped them buy about well, eight of them now. Well, which the, one? The one where people had to, had to, they, had to get out. They did a subject two on it. So that, that was, yeah, I forgot exactly what the story was on it, but I do know they had to downsize. They couldn't afford the house anymore. I think he had lost his job. The seller had lost his job. And so again, multiple stacking, right? You could say that was downsized and or he was downsizing his job. So he had to downsize his house. Yeah, They couldn't afford it. So kind of a double D on that one, right? Double D, is that right? All right, that's, that's a big bra size. Okay, anyways, so- <laughs> Only you would go there. <laughs> I'm a Gen Xer. Guys will understand. So they, there's two different things there they had to deal with was they were downsized and uh, they couldn't afford it. So now they went in and we helped them actually take over payments, do what's called a subject two. And subject two is where you just take over the existing payments without a credit check, without doing an end of background check, without anything. You literally sign a piece of paper and take over the people's payments on that house. We helped them do that and they flipped that house. I think they made around $60,000 on doing that deal. But that was found through a referral. They found out that somebody would need to downsize. They had to get out of their house fast because they couldn't afford it anymore. And they were able to take that over. So yeah. it was a cool, cool experience for yeah. them. So I love helping our students. 
So look, that's four areas we just talked about. We have more episodes coming up in this series. We have two more episodes coming up. We're going to dive into more of these things and do some of our Gen X fun stuff and um, and talk about that. But we covered dilapidated, we covered dated, we covered destination, and we covered downsized. And you've got to figure out how to get your hands. We just talked about how to find all these things too. Some of the even more popular ones are coming up in the next oh, yeah. two episodes here. Oh yeah, they sure are. We're yeah. going to dive into all those and do it more. So hopefully you learned a lot today and we'll, uh, we'll see you on the next episode. That concludes this episode of the Fearless Future podcast. If you liked what you heard, make sure you click that like button. And to make sure that you hear part three and part four of this series, turn on notifications and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss it when it comes out.